All right, hello, welcome back to the podcast once again, everybody, to a special episode. PayPal and Patreon links are both down below for anybody who wants to support me. Only do so if you actually can, obviously. So, every couple of years, I remake uh, past important videos, as obviously over the course of a few years, new developments happen, new information comes up. So the time has come for a uh, Peak Oil Projections remake video. I did a video with various uh, graphs for global oil production, along with the uh, major oil producing countries. However, uh, that was before the events of uh, 2020 and 2021. So now factoring in the uh, reduced production from these past two years, uh, 2020 primarily so, 2021 less so, uh, along with expansions and expectations uh, that have developed. Obviously the production graphs have to be updated. So obviously just looking at the projection for global oil production in total, so previously, uh, throughout the mid and later 2010s, the expectation was for oil to probably peak around the mid-2020s, uh, between 2024 and 2026 or so. The reduced production levels, uh, primarily from 2020, uh, somewhat from this past year now, 2021, have managed uh, to push that out a bit up to 2025 to 2028. And part of that also is because of uh, new discoveries and information that have come out in that time. It should peak around there and uh, sort of start declining, at least at first, by only a few hundred thousand barrels a year. Uh, so sort of a declination plateau, you could call it, for a short period of time before it then starts, you know, uh, arching over and heading down, down. And then obviously after uh, several decades of steeper losses uh, from more conventional sources, it then uh, starts getting shallower in the decline and not necessarily levels off, but uh, sort of looks like it heads in that direction as what remains are much more uh, lengthier, more stable production sources like the tar sands in Alberta and the seemingly infinite uh, Ornico belt in Venezuela. And so overall peak in the moment for global production in total looks like it will come right around uh, 110 or so, or maybe a bit above it, maybe 111 or maybe 112 million barrels a day. So in my particular outlook, I don't believe uh, it will actually reach the 118 or 120 uh, that the EIA, I believe it was, uh, expected that it would reach. And then going into some individual uh, countries, uh, the EIA, one of the many other acronyms, I heavily disagree with them because they're a bit outside of reality in that uh, they believe uh, U.S. oil production will get up to between 13 and 14 million barrels per day. And then uh, most of their like, outlook graphs literally have it staying there indefinitely all the way to 2050 which is not how shale works, uh, so that's not going to happen. Initially, uh, the U.S. outlook was, uh, from my end at least, likely going to peak towards 14 million barrels per day, but probably short of it, uh, probably the upper 13s. Now, because of uh, these past two years, the time frame has been pushed off. However, uh, production has been ongoing from the various U.S. shale plays during that time, which has uh, degraded their inevitable capability a bit. So now I more expect uh, the U.S. should probably peak between mid-13s and upper-13s. That would be my expected high point uh, as they continue uh, trying to re-ramp shale production and head towards the original target zone. And then after that, uh, they'll be able to keep it there for just a bit. However, the inevitable uh, precipitous nature of shale will start to take over afterwards, and the U.S. will enter into a steeper decline. And... Uh, Overwhelmingly, the majority of U.S. production is coming from shale, as uh, U.S. conventional oil production by now, uh, probably in the background, has declined down to around like 4 million barrels per day. So uh, by the time we hit peak towards, we'll round it up to 14 million, uh, 10 million barrels per day out of that is going to be coming from shale. So uh, the U.S. production curve is going to uh, follow the general shale pattern and is going to drop down steeply until uh, later decades you start getting towards the bottom of it, by which time U.S. Uh, conventional production should have declined down to probably between 2 and 3, and then you'll see the U.S. curve start uh, leveling off towards a much shallower decline. 
Russia, Russia is uh, rapidly flooring the accelerator, trying to absolutely race their production up towards their maximum capable point, which is most likely around 12, uh, maybe mid-12. We'll have to wait and see, obviously. And over just the next couple of years, uh, they should be able to take it up to that point. However, a huge amount of their fields, also I apologize if you can hear the rain in the background, but uh, a huge proportion of their fields are uh, very large but old. Uh, they are mature fields, very matured fields, and aging rapidly. So uh, their decline is also not going to be uh, very favorable once they uh, cross over that point. They may be able uh, to slow it down a bit in time, depending on uh, how rapidly they push into either the Arctic or the far east of the country and uh, develop uh, resources out there, which there should be a fair bit of. But uh, in contrast, though, the, uh, the declines are going to be steep enough from their many aged fields that they've been keeping alive, uh, that they've been going out of their way to keep alive at levels for some time, that uh, new added things will not really be able to shallow out their decline too much. Uh, at least not initially. Canada uh, should be able to keep pushing upwards uh, by a bit. However, after that, uh, their outlook doesn't look too great. Uh, although they could keep pushing the tar sands further, and uh, they definitely uh, have a lot in the Arctic, particularly uh, probably in uh, Baffin Bay. However, Canada has been taking more of a, uh, a hardcore environmentalist route, similar to Europe. So I, I doubt they're going to uh, push development uh, all that much further unless their government shifts about in the immediate future. So their current trajectory, they should keep going on, but eventually that's, that's going to taper off and uh, they are going to become subjected to declines from all of their non-Tarsan related fields and uh, that's going to start dragging them down uh, at a less steep decline than the U.S. or Russia, but it will start dragging them down a bit. South of the U.S., Mexico does uh, have a bit more that it can keep going with in the Gulf uh, that it has been pursuing. However, uh, it's, it's not really going to stall them off all that much uh, unless they really, really go hardcore for it. But uh, it should continue doing as it has been doing. Uh, sort of stalling them off and uh, bringing them back up in production by a little bit in the upper ones towards round two uh, for a number of years before inevitably it's it's just not going to be enough to hold it off and uh, they're going to just tip over the edge and keep going back down. Brazil does have enough offshore stuff uh, across their various basins to keep going both in uh, new fields that uh, they are intending to bring into production soon and in production expansions uh, that they are uh, most likely working on as well. In that, they should most likely be able to meet their goal of uh, 4 million or so by around the mid-2020s. And then after that, they should be able to keep adding to it uh, by a bit. Uh, they can try to creep their way up towards 5, but inevitably uh, the decline in age of uh, all their prior fields is inevitably going to catch up to them, and they're going to tip over the edge as well. Their small northern neighbor, Guyana, uh, is going to be a decent uh, producer compared to its size, at least in numbers, for a, a short blip of time, at least compared to uh, the length of time of other oil producers. Uh, initially, I expected them to get up to probably like 1.1 or 1.2. Uh, the expansion of their resources has adjusted that outlook to more likely uh, maybe between 1.5 and 1.7. Uh, sometime during the 2030s before they tip over the edge and start going down. China has been really dragging its uh, many large but uh, mature and aging fields out for quite a bit of time, uh, trying to avoid an actual uh, terminal decline slope. And uh, they've been adding some new stuff uh, offshore of uh, some of their southern provinces and also in the Bohai Bay region. However, they don't really have much left they can keep going. A lot of their shale ended up not being uh, as producible as hoped. Uh, they can probably keep dragging this out for a few more years with some of the offshore stuff they're bringing on, but after that uh, they're not really going to be able to stall it for much longer. And then we have uh, uh, the likes of, say, Saudi Arabia, 
who will be the first one to reach the end of its ability to uh, maintain their production plateau. Now keep in mind with all of these graphs, the, the main one, the individual countries, uh, the OPEC ones especially, all of these are just based on assumptions. Uh, you can see from actual production graphs that uh, straight lines do not exist as, you know, things happen, fields get shut down for maintenance occasionally, conflicts uh, happen inevitably. So the graphs I'm giving are obviously much more of a generalized average projection, but in general, on the assumption that uh, Saudi Arabia is just about to return to their 10 million barrel per day plateau, uh, then they should be able to keep holding that just until the early 2030s, and that should be about the end of it. After which, uh, whether they admit that's what's going on or not, they will begin entering into a very tapered, uh, not even necessarily a decline, just kind of a general step-down slide-off effect or so. And then several of the others uh, hold plateaus as well. Assuming Kuwait is going back to holding their 3 million barrel per day plateau, they should be able to keep that going until uh, sometime during the 2040s. For Iran, it's a much less predictable uh, situation because uh, whether they're able to return to their plateau in the immediate years or not depends on whether the sanctions keep being lifted. So basically this graph is a uh, assumption scenario that the sanctions are lifted, in which case it will take them a bit of time to restore everything back up to their 4 million barrel per day plateau, a uh, plateau of which they could maintain until just about uh, hitting the 2040s or so, like just getting into the decade. Then as a standard for the infinite plateau holders, uh, they will begin a very gradual taper off scenario. Uh, the UAE, I am using this graph, I'm doing this graph uh, on the assumption that they intend to restore themselves uh, next year or the year after, uh, once the production cuts are completely over, back to their newly selected plateau of 4 million barrels per day that they were about to start holding instead of the 3 million barrel per day one that they had been holding. So if they do go back to a 4 million barrel per day plateau, uh, they should be able to hold that until uh, until either the mid or later 2030s. Iraq is a different story. Uh, the only reason they were holding a 4.5 million barrel per day plateau was because that was their agreement under the previous production cuts uh, the much lighter production cuts from before the global health situation. However, uh, those will no longer be in effect uh, after the end of these ones, which are already ending as they're being eased off. Uh, so Iraq is no longer going to be staying at four and a half. Uh, they intend on just pursuing their maximum production capability as far as they can go, which is likely going to be uh, uh, up over seven and eight, uh, probably up towards nine or so. And then after that, uh, they'll have a more, at least somewhat normal looking uh, decline because of actually pursuing their production up to a maximum peak instead of holding a plateau for several decades like many of the others. But in terms of the various OPEC members, uh, they will end up having the highest production for the longest uh, and being quote unquote the last one standing. And then I'll put in a few of the others uh, like Libya and Nigeria. Libya, as long as they intend on holding a smaller plateau, uh, like the two or so that they intend to try to get themselves up to over the 2020s, despite having smaller resources uh, than many of the others, uh, the small scale of their plateau would mean they would actually be able to hold that production level. Nigeria does have a decent bit. However, Nigeria has been having uh, issues, infrastructure issues, development issues, uh, investment issues in maintaining and furthering the oil production. So uh, Nigeria isn't uh, going to have as smooth of a story going forward. Venezuela, uh, assuming they continue uh, pursuing the restoration of their oil production, uh, they should be able to get back up to uh, their 3 million barrel per day plateau. And they are going to be the only ones who on their graph are going to just keep growing in production, assuming no wars, no asteroid strikes, uh, the country doesn't societally implode on itself again, and it should keep growing beyond its 3 million barrel per day production very slowly, uh, because developing the heavy oil of the Ornico belt is not exactly easy. Uh, however, with the kinds of oil prices that are going to be uh, seen, 
in this uh, not too far away future, uh, that definitely should uh, begin prodding the development of the Ornico belt, even if it's going to come in a gradual fashion. And so their uh, production should creep its way up. And back outside of OPEC, Kazakhstan uh, has enough definitely to still uh, get up to a roughly 2.6 million barrel per day peak, I would expect. And assuming they continue pursuing raising their production at least, uh, they should be able to reach that by either the later 2020s or early 2030s. And they might be able to stagnate there for a little bit before they start sloping downwards. And then outside of uh, all of them, for the most part, everyone else is uh, basically all minor producers. So many dozens of countries uh, added together are producing their particular uh, net effects on the global production slope and all. And that's the part where I apologize to all of you, but I, I didn't feel like making dozens and dozens of graphs. I don't want to make one for literally every single country on Earth. So those are at least my generalized, remember, uh, outlooks or projection graphs for for world oil production uh, as of what is known at this point in time and for most of the major producing countries. And so thusly, that's it for this episode. Thank you, everybody, for sticking around and listening. And, well, actually, this one included watching as well. Uh, you can support me through PayPal, Patreon if you want. I'll be extremely grateful to anybody who does. Just only do so if you actually can. But no matter what happens to me anyway, uh, may God bless and protect all of you. And I will see you all around next time.